<laughs> so let's talk. Let's talk about um, who's your favorite founding father. Do you have one? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, of of all those, I would say Lincoln, and he was not necessarily a founding father, I suppose. Although, really, he kept the country from splitting in two. Uh, almost, well, he, almost he, single-handedly. He shaped, I mean, he shaped the country single-handedly for sure. Yeah, yeah. But let's go. If you had to pick one from the old days, the original probably Jeff, founding, probably founding. Jefferson. I mean, all okay. of these were real men, and they had weaknesses. You know, I don't agree with the fact that uh, Jefferson was the one who wrote. You know, we sh- we're all created equal, even though he owned slaves. So there are some contradictions. But yeah, I would have to. I don't know. I love. I love all the stories I hear about Ben Franklin. Uh, I just love Thomas Jefferson's writing. He was an amazing writer and really eloquent with his thoughts. He was. He definitely was a penman. He had some good penmanship yeah, or, or wordsmithing. Yeah. Um, but he was terrible with money. Was he? <laughs> yes. That doesn't surprise he, me, actually. You know, he died broke. He did? Mm. That's terrible. That's good. Yeah. Um, a lot of the founding fathers did, believe it or not. Mm. There's a reason for all that, but I want to go through some Thomas Jefferson. Here's a quote from Thomas Jefferson. Never spend your money before you have it. He said that? He said that. My mom Never my mom says your money that too. Before you have it. Maybe she's related. <laughs> you know <laughs> Thomas Jefferson says never spend your money before you have it. That's a good life lesson right there. Right. Um but that's really what is happening to a lot of people in this country. Uh, they are spending money before they have it. Most of the times because they're trying to keep up with the Joneses. But um, it was the case that um, a lot of these, you know, think back to the founding fathers. Um, Most of them were wealthy at the start. They, like Jefferson and Washington, they, they owned a lot of land. Yep slaves they had wealth that they either inherited or just built up over time um, just through land acquisition then you had the lawyers who just made money through their job Adams Madison so um, they had this money so when you when you hear about Jefferson spending money and doing different things they had it to spend right it's the debt that is the problem so Thomas Jefferson's point and the lesson that you learned is you don't want to get in debt. But if you think about America, you know, the American dream, very different than what it was back then. Right. But the American dream today is, oh, you, you get the house and, and you get the family and you get a job and you retire. Right. Or isn't that what I think the American dream is supposed to be? Something like that. Anyone can succeed and you buy your house. But you think about the house purchase. Most people buy a house with little down. So they're they're in a huge debt right there. You know, so technically they're spending money before they have it. Um, And a lot of people do that. And I think debt is the biggest problem that we face in this country for people trying to retire. And uh, it's a lesson that we aren't taking too too well, I don't think. If only Thomas Jefferson was around to say it. But then again, we'll get to how he what happened to him in the end. Um, it's not pretty. It's really not. Pre- I was thinking about this, doing, you know, reading about it because I knew about these things. But if you think about it, you think, oh, Thomas Jefferson, you think if he's a celebrity, you know, he, he, you know, he, he must have been wealthy. <laughs> yeah. You know, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. I mean, you'd seem he what more. Can you do? <laughs> yeah. You'd think he would be well taken care of or be able to monetize his position. Right. Nowadays, yeah, but there, you there was monetize no, your position. There was no major universities that would pay you to come speak. That's true. I guess it was a, a really, really different time. I mean, we're not just talking about a different time like our grandparents. We're talking about a truly night and day difference, I guess. Uh, so I think it was probably a lot harder for them to monetize popularity back then. That's right. Um, and one of the big things that, that happened with Jefferson, he, he owned mostly land. So eventually it became too difficult to sell. And he lost liquidity. You know, he didn't have enough money. And in the end, um, he lost out. He didn't have, he didn't have as much money as when he started. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, that's too bad. So, but, um, you know, he spent the money, but he he invested it in something that didn't pan out for him in the end. Now, the big, you know, when you talk about money for people starting out well, 
who do you think started? I, I'm not sure if it's 100% accurate. I'm just talking about the big ones. But who do, who do you think had the most money, the founding fathers? Who, who started out with? George Washington. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. He, he had so much land and slaves and property and, and just, you know. So a quote from him. This is a goodie, too. Oh, man, this is one that I, I, I love to, to say. Uh, it's, tough, it, it, it's tough to follow, but um, here George Washington said, to contract new debts is not the way to pay old ones. To contract new debts is not the way to pay old ones. Wow. So don't take on debt to pay off old debt. Yeah. People do it all the time. Well, yeah. Yeah. Refinance the house. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Refinancing the house. Exactly. That's exactly right. That's a, that's a prime example. Um, so he's saying don't do that. Oh, yeah. Don't do that. And that's because, one of the I mean, big financial what happens, lessons. That's what we're talking about. So the founding fathers had some good advice. Whether they followed it themselves, uh, in like in Thomas Jefferson's case, he did not, uh, or not, it's a lesson to be learned about debt. Well, in to the defense, as you'll see, a lot of these um, founding fathers actually failed with money. Um, to their defense, it was a different time. Yeah, there was so much uncertainty with currency, with inflation, with land that, and plus they were fighting a war. You know, like yeah. they, someone had to pay for it. So. Um, there's a, it's not like today where, you know, but, but that, but these lessons that they said then still apply, but, um, you're right that, that one from Washington, you know, what, what happens is people, they have a debt, you know, I owe the, you know, I owe whatever credit card, $10,000. So they'll borrow from someone else or another card to pay off that first one. And now they have two debts, you know, or they're using the money from the new card to partially pay the minimum balance on the other one. And before you know it, it snowballs into this huge balloon, b big debt payment, you know? And so back to Thomas Jefferson, never spend your money before you have it. Don't use those credit cards. Yeah. And then if you do have a credit card debt, don't take another credit card or another debt out to pay for it. That's right. what George Washington said. So you add George Washington and Thomas Jefferson together. What do you have? $6, right? <laughs> no. Is that right? <laughs> Tom Jefferson's oh he's twenty one dollars yeah twenty it's, <laughs> Jefferson's on the twenty Washington's on the do, a dollar so you, you had you had up their advice you got twenty one dollars to pay toward that credit card debt exactly I get the joke but it it, it almost worked you almost well, you almost had it <laughs> no because Andrew Jackson's on on the uh, on the twenty dollar bill Jefferson a, Abe's Abe's on the five. Where is where is Thomas Jefferson? Where is Thomas Jefferson? That's what we. I'm. I'm. That's how do I not know that? I don't. He's know. He's on the two dollar bill, right? Two. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't quite work as well. Uh, but yes, you'd have three dollars then. Uh, yeah, Jefferson's not on the twenty. You're right. He's on the two dollar bill, and the reason why I know that is because my parents give my kids two dollar bills all the time. Oh, I don't know. ask me where they get it from. So they so they'll be you know well, here's a quick story a little aside I was at a swim meet in Largo, and uh, you know my kids oh can we get something from the concession stand oh daddy doesn't have any money, and the, so they got they got wind of that so they started bringing their own money, and uh, because you lie say, because you need... lie to them and tell them you have nothing you're lying no, to I your don't children. I don't have any cash because I, say, I don't you're have tight. any cash yeah I don't have any cash <laughs> the concession stand is not accepting credit card. you're poor kids. so. So they, so one of my kids, Jonathan, he, um, he's like, dad, look what I found in the bushes. I'm like, and he holds a $2 bill. I'm like, oh really? Where'd you find it? He brings, he walks me over. He points to the ground. Like uh -huh. he's right underneath that bush over there. Uh -huh. I'm like, that just so happened to be a $2 bill. Now, if it was a dollar bill, I might've believed him, but who carries $2 <laughs> bills no, around? But nobody, them, you know, nobody. <laughs> so he brought one of grandma's $2 bills that he got yep. that and he's then supposed to be found saving. it. Right. Oh, right, that's right. awesome. Kids are so, so funny. He was so busted. He totally. But uh, so if you add <laughs> Jefferson and, and Washington, you got three dollars, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny story about you. Oh, kids. So okay. Yeah. So let's move on to another uh, another lesson. My I have a couple of my my favorite founding father is um, John Adams. He's underrated. Oh, sure, John Adams. Yeah. You know, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little life lesson from him. Um, now, 
there was, I think there was a movie made or a made for TV movie, um, about John Adams. That was pretty good. It was like a mini series. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. And they didn't talk about the financial lessons in it, but they did talk about his wife, Abigail. And it turns out when you read about Adams, you find that he wasn't very financially savvy. He was a lawyer, right? So he was making good money, but he wanted to invest in land like all the other rich guys that he was hanging out with. But his wife, um, she stopped him. Abigail stopped him. And someone wrote an autobiography on them. I forget the name of the author, but he quoted, he was saying, you know, the best thing that ever happened to, to John Adams financially was him going away for 10 years. You know, because he, with the war, he went to France. You know, he was in London. So he, he was away. And that left Abigail in charge of everything. And at one point during the revolution, you know, and afterward, um, the government was selling bonds to raise money. And they were worthless, really, because the government was, you know, yeah. are we going to have a government? You right. know, like we're fledgling. So the government bonds were trash. And they were, and so she, instead of buying land, she was buying these government bonds from pennies on the dollar. They were using government bonds to pay the soldiers and different, you know, for government services. And she was astute enough, kind of like Warren Buffett, you know, when everyone else is selling, it's time to buy. And when everyone else is buying, it's time to sell or panicking, you know, mm -hmm. um, she bought government bonds, which were considered trash. And then of course, what happened to the government, it stabilized and then boom, right? That's what she, and that's all her. He had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and, and if you read about it, you know, it's, it, he, he's like, you know, um, he's trying to, he was trying to send money from France and she's like, don't send money, send goods, send, you know, cause I can resell them here. You know, even if I lose one ship out of every three you send with goods, just due to pirates, literally, um, <laughs> you know, um, wow. I still come out ahead. She was doing the math. The lesson, lesson learned from John Adams. If you don't leave the investing for someone that understands it, if you don't understand it yourself. Right. Or you can say happy wife is a happy life. Right. Right. You know, if your wife's smarter than you, do it. If your husband's smarter than you, let them handle it. Right. You got to stay involved, but sometimes you got to pass the financial duties to someone that knows what they're doing. Yeah. You know, and don't, and, don't try and be and, a hero. And someone you trust. Right. Of course. Yeah, exactly. That's why I want you handling. I trust you, Dan. I would trust Abigail Adams with my money. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but wait, you're not going to return the favor and say you'd trust me with your money. Oh man, got, I couldn't hear you there. Uh, did you hear that? You hear that siren going off? Can't did hear we, you. Did anyway, break up? <laughs> something, something. Did I got a bad connection. Yeah, yeah. You got to speak more clearly next time. I'm a little deaf in this ear. Um, my wife runs the family finances. You know, every every it's funny. Everyone that comes through my door door at work, I'm helping them with their financial situation. You know, we're gonna figure out how to retire. I'm doing all the work. You know, we're meeting. I'm running the numbers, creating these reports. I get other people to help me with these things. But in the end, you know, I'm overseeing. I'm the quarterback. And when I go home, my wife's the quarterback. You know, she's in charge. Right now, things are happening in my financial world that I don't even know about because my wife's pulling the strings. It, uh, she just, that she's good. She's really smart. And I get it. You know, I, I oversee. I don't, I don't just play ignorant. I, I, I get involved and I review. But she's the one that runs the show and I understand that and I trust her and, and that's good. Yeah. You got to know your strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I'm really sure. good at helping people retire yep. and other people. But when I get home from work, I don't want to think about it anymore. I don't want to think about numbers, you know? Yeah. So then I sense. read my history books. Then I read my history books. <laughs> <laughs> then it's history. So the mm -hmm. founding fathers, so John Adams had a good lesson. Sounds like he was one of the smarter ones when it came to his money. Uh, he was. Uh, his wife was, yeah. actually. <laughs> but he was, uh, no, he was smart for realizing that she needed to take care of it. It's totally true. It just, but you got to think about how amazing these guys were in terms of what they did. You know, he was a lawyer, but he founded a country. You know, like, I mean, we're complaining about, you know, soccer, I'm, I complain sometimes of soccer coaching. I don't know anything about soccer. I got a coach. You know, <laughs> right? Try running a business and founding a country. You know, <laughs> right? That 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 would be a little harder than being a soccer coach on the side. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, they really uh, gave it their all too. I mean, George Washington really answered the call uh, when 
he was needed. So, you know what? We should take a quick break here, Dan. Is there anything else you want to add before we do? Yeah. Well, what I want to let the listeners know is um, I'm actually heading up north for a little while. I'm going to see family. Actually, uh, one of the side trips we're going to do is go to Plymouth Plantation, which is in Massachusetts. It's like a little uh, old world town, you know, by Plymouth Rock, and people dress up like, you know, the, you know, I guess before the revolution, the, the pilgrims. So um, I'm going to connect back to history, but I'm going to be gone for a while visiting family. And so the radio show live that you're listening to now is going to be taking a break. But we're still going to be doing some podcasts. As Tony knows, uh, the, the, our, our conversations never end. And we record them <laughs> and we put them online and we let people listen in. And so if you're, if you're listening to this and you, and you like the show and you want to stay in tune, just go to dolphinfinancialgroup.com, click on the radio button, and you'll have our podcast there. And there's a subscribe button. Whether you use iTunes or Google Play, you can click on the button and subscribe. So anytime we update and put a new show out there, you may not hear it on over the air, but you can have it go right to your email or to your phone and listen to it at your leisure. So that's what I recommend you doing is going to dolphinfinancialgroup.com, signing up for our podcast, Tony, because I may be traveling a bit, but we'll still talk, right? We'll still, we'll still be in touch. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. even if I go to uh, Mount Rushmore, well, I'm not going to Mount Rushmore. I will go eventually. Yes. I'm heading up to New York, Massachusetts. Listeners, Dan has a lot more for us regarding founding fathers and financial advice right here on Dolphin Financial Radio after this. My name is Trevor, and we'll be right back with more Dolphin Financial Radio. Hi, this is Peter, and you are listening to my dad talk about financial stuff. Radio is cool, but if you're like me, you would rather watch videos. Did you know my dad has a YouTube channel? Go to dolphinfinancialgroup.com or search for Dolphin Financial Group on YouTube to watch some cool videos. This is Peter signing out with a Dolphin Noise. And welcome back to Dolphin Financial Radio with our host, Dan Wendell, and myself, your co-host, Tony Shore. And what a great show, talking about financial advice from our founding fathers. Uh, we recently celebrated July 4th and our independence as a country and a nation. And wow, I don't think anybody did more to make that happen than George Washington, as far as the Revolutionary War goes. And he, you mentioned earlier in the show, started off uh, very wealthy as a landowner and owned a lot of things. Uh, but yet he also did so much for the state of our union and uh, really making our country what it is today, his his sheer tenacity, and I guess he was also humble about it. Uh, and, well, and that's yeah, what's he cool. was. Well, he, you're right, he was rich. He showed up, well, during the Continental Congress and, and the discussions about should we revolt and, and what are we going to do, he would show up in full military gear. So he knew he was ready. He, he was grooming himself. So it wasn't like he was like, oh, little old me is going to lead the, you know, he, oh, no, he stepped yeah. up. He's a military but, leader, yeah. And he was tall and he was powerful and he was perfect for the job. Now he, oh man, his story is amazing. I mean, if you haven't, gosh, if you haven't taken the time to read about these guys, uh, t t please do because it's just amazing what they did. I have such respect for these guys. Now, granted, they lived at different times, so they had different, you know, Problems. concepts. Yeah. You know, and the slavery is a big issue, but yep. and George Washington did have a lot. But what he did for this country is amazing. Um, he was the richest. He, but what's interesting, a little lesson from George Washington. He said. Don't pay old debts with new ones, you know. Right. But one thing that we can learn from him is that he diversified. Um, in the end, Washington was a loser as well in terms of financial. He, he they, There was a lot of financial trouble when he died. Um, wasn't necessarily his fault because he, of all the founding fathers that were rich when they started, he, he maintained his wealth mostly better than the others throughout, mostly because he was very diversified. He, he, you know, you hear that word diversify. Um, he owned stocks and bonds. No, no. Um, he, he was truly diversified. And like, for instance, the big, the big crop back in the day was tobacco, but he switched to wheat at one point 
because he saw the writing on the wall and he started selling the wheat um, for food and so, and so forth. Um, at one point, he realized land was not really going to be the place to go. So he stopped buying land and he started renting it. He started renting uh-huh. his land. Interesting. Um, instead of buying more. So instead of taking on more debt, he actually used the debt he had on his current land and started getting income from it. Uh, I believe I don't I, this one I haven't verified, but I believe it's true that he at one point bought docks on the Chesapeake River and charged people to actually use them. So he would generate income from different sources. So it wasn't all, hey, I'm a tobacco man. It was, hey, let I got different. And, and so that helped him as things changed. He had different sources to rely on. You know, if tobacco is not doing well, well, maybe wheat is or maybe fishery, you know, so. He definitely diversified, whereas, you know, we talked Thomas Jefferson, he was mostly land. So in the end, it became too difficult for Jefferson to sell it, and he wound up broke. Washington was able to weather the storm a little bit. But what got Washington in the end was inflation. You know, he got all this. When he was at the war, he got he didn't he, he didn't get any money during the war. He, he paid for his spies out of his own pocket. Yeah, Literally. I know he paid for a lot out of his own pocket. Some of the the wealthy people basically were the government at that time or what we had of it. And so they had to fund that war themselves. Absolutely. And, you know, he got paid back in the end. But when, by the time he got paid back, inflation was just like, yeah, you know, here's the here's the thousand dollars you spent. Um, it's worth, you know, a dollar today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, you're not on the dollar, by yeah. the way. But you know, um, so during the time he's spending his money at high premium and then later on when inflation kicked in and you know with the currency problems of the new country it really wasn't worth as much so he he lost out and he spent a lot of his own money to fund the war and then you know obviously land and different things worked to their disadvantage um but the key lesson from him at that point was don't put all your eggs in one basket you know switch things up and the same goes for today you know if you're investing you don't want to put all your eggs in we we like we did the show on marijuana you know that's maybe that's the new tobacco but you don't want to go all the way with it you might put a little dabble a little in that within your portfolio you might want to have a little bit of oil or uh, different industries um, you might go international versus US and dabble and and spread it out diversify but then even further, you want to get out of the stock market with some of your money put some in safety put some in maybe real estate put some in, in the bank. You, the, the key is you don't want to get caught by something that happens in a particular, one particular industry. It, again, it was different when Washington, I mean, he had such different things to worry about. But, um, you know, he, it's, it's the same lesson applies. It's just we have different things to diversify in, but you still need to diversify. You can't put all your eggs in that one basket. Right. And that's a very good lesson. So uh, obviously the founding fathers uh, had struggles of their own, but they also uh, managed to give some great advice. And I know Jefferson had some great advice as well. I mean, you know, he helped pen the Declaration of Independence. So it's we always respect him. But like you said, a lot of people don't realize Jefferson ended up broke right? because you know, he was too far know. in debt. Do you know who else ended up broke? Do you know who the first Secretary of the Treasury was? No. Under Washington? No. Alexander Hamilton. Oh, Hamilton, yeah. Remember him? Isn't there like a play? There is a play, I'm Isn't saying. There Isn't there like a Isn't play? There like a play? <laughs> uh, I hope you were joking. Yes, there's I definitely a, a musical. Uh, yeah, Hamilton. Man, my, my daughter is crazy for that musical. She actually just saw it. So. I had never seen it. I don't really know what it's about. I'm assuming it's about Hamilton's life. It is. But I could be wrong. Nope, it is about but, Hamilton's life. He, he was our first Treasury Secretary, and I don't know if they get into the finances of it, but he did die broke. Um, he's the one that lost the duel yep. to uh, Aaron Burr. Yep. That's fascinating, by the way. I did, at one point in my life, I got really into that and read a whole bunch about duels. Like, that was a way of handling things. and um, Not a good a way, lot of mind you, but a way. And at the time they did that, it was they did it over in Weehawk in New Jersey. I used to drive past there all the time when I lived there. Um, and they did it right on the the, sh- the cliffs, the Palisades over there, right by across from uh, New York City. Um, it was illegal in New York, but it was also illegal in New Jersey to do the duel. So this is when it was like, hey, maybe we shouldn't do it. But Hamilton wanted to do it in New Jersey 
because they were less uh, stringent on, on enforcing the law. <laughs> it's such a fascinating thing how wow. they did it. Because the people that were observing... They like smuggled the guns in like a box so you couldn't see it so they can legally say, I never saw a gun. And then they had their back to them. So what really happened is unknown because the witnesses turned their back so they didn't witness it so they can legally say, I didn't see it, you know. Um, but Hamilton lost. Um, and he died from the gunshot wound yep. from Aaron Burr. What happened next is he died, I think, the next day. And when they buried him, they had to pass the hat. They had to collect money. His wife, his, his widow, had to collect money at his funeral. He didn't have enough. We're talking the Secretary of the Treasury. Wow. <laughs> the guy that had money com coming in. And he was a lawyer. Wow. The, the, so what happened? Why, why did he go bankrupt? Um, a couple of, of thoughts on that. Um, he had seven kids. So <laughs> Okay. But number one problem. <laughs> they, see you later. Yep. Yeah. Um, college was a lot cheaper then. All right. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if he had the expense of hockey for his right, children, they, or, right, right, or baseball they, they, or soccer, right? Yeah, uh, or the the tablets. They each had their own. They each had to get their own Wi Fi tablet. Mm -hmm. no. Um, so kids are kids. They're expensive, you know. Yep. Uh, again, though, I guess they could put them to work on the fields um, at age six, but uh, or earlier, Balin Hay. But um, so and he had a couple of mistresses. So those that wasn't cheap for him either, apparently. Probably not. I, don't, I, don't, I wonder if they go through that in the play. You know, they talk about Mr. Anyway. Um, but I just, there was an account from some prince from, from France that came by um, and witnessed Hamilton making a speech and then heading back to his office to do legal work by himself. He didn't have staff. He didn't have enough money to pay, like, a scribe or assistant. So he would write his own legal documents as a lawyer just to get by while he's doing this other stuff. And, um, you know, they, they lived, they had this image, they had to live the high life, you know, spend money on, on expensive wines and, and different things that were coming in at the time, but they were struggling. Um, they were like a duck, you know, wow. they looked great. They looked great. I'm the treasury secretary, you know, I'm a very peaceful and serene, but under that water, that duck's legs is swimming like crazy. Yeah. Right? Treading um, water. So, you know, Alexander Hamilton, classic example. Wow. Of of you know you, you, you don't you have your money but don't spend it before you know before you make it he was he was by the seat of his pants and uh, didn't have anything in the end the other lesson I guess is he should have bought life insurance you know so that as nothing's worse than seeing um, a GoFundMe account when someone dies hey we didn't you know we can't we can't afford the burial that's the worst yeah I mean that that's happens. sad we see that all the time isn't it's crazy yeah. You know, I need a GoFundMe account because, uh, you know, I got a, an accident. I don't have health insurance. Right. I don't have life insurance. So you can't pay for the funeral. You know, maybe if a child dies, you know, yeah, maybe you don't have life insurance on a child because no one wants to think that way. But as an adult with seven kids, come on now. And don't say life insurance didn't exist at the time Hamilton was, you know, <laughs> Treasury Secretary because <laughs> life insurance goes way back before the founding of this country. Yeah. There was there was insurance companies in in the. Uh, England. In America yeah. uh, at the time, yeah. so he could have done it. And in England before they even got over for here. Sure. So, yeah. For sure. So it's not like it... Yeah. Some of those companies but, are still around today. I know. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's I forget, crazy. I forget the name. It was like American Pioneer or American something yep. or other. Still around. So, um, yeah, crazy as it sounds, he should have prepared for that. But most people don't. They just, they're living in the moment and they think they're invincible. They think I'm going to have my law lawyer income for the rest of my life, and, uh, and then you know things get in the way, like uh, like a bullet from Aaron Burr. <laughs> yeah, yeah, life happens, uh, and uh, and then it doesn't. Uh, yeah, that was a tragedy, uh, especially because Hamilton had a lot of great things that he did and said, but again, he had a lot of issues, like you said. On the surface, the duck looks fine, but underneath, those legs were paddling just to keep afloat it's a common thread for all the the um, founding fathers but the other thing that hamilton you know maybe it's not a financial lesson is you gotta chill when it comes to politics him and Aaron Burr hated each other yeah. enough where they they would they would went to a duel now the historical context of it is hamilton actually shot above burr and intentionally missed him that's what they used to do yeah these these duels, they used to shoot in the ground just to say I'm tough, you know. So I I was willing to take that yeah. final step. But uh, so Alexander Hamilton apparently, I mean, again, 
people's backs were to him, shot above the head, and then Aaron Burr said, whoa, I heard that, whizzed past my head and shot him in the gut. So, you know, maybe Aaron Burr wanted, they hated each other from political, um, you know, governorship of New York and this and that. It, just don't get caught up in politics, especially, you know, when you want to get deadly about it. Yeah. Exactly. Take a deep breath. <laughs> take a deep breath. And that's what we're going to do here because we need to take another quick break. Dan, is there anything you want to add before the break? Absolutely. When we get back, we're going to talk about your favorite founding father and perhaps the biggest financial lessons from the founding fathers, our good old $100 bill boy, not a president. We got I tricked you up on that one, $100 bill, Ben Franklin. Yeah. But. Um, if you're listening, you're listening to Dolphin Financial Radio. Uh, like I said earlier, we're going to be taking a, a a live show break for a little while, but we're going to be doing the podcast. So if you don't hear us on the radio and you say, "Well, where did he go?" I'm up in New York visiting family and Massachusetts visiting family for the summer, and uh, I am still doing podcasts. We're going to talk about some pretty cool topics. Um, I think Tony, one that we should talk about is taking Social Security early. I just did a. Um, a seminar on social security and it's fresh in my mind. So let's do a podcast on social security that and great. why people should take it early and why should people should delay. It's uh, anyway, um, you go to dolphin financial group.com and you click on the radio button and you'll see there's uh, the ability to actually subscribe to the podcast, um, Google play, or if you use iPhone, it's iTunes and boom, they come directly to your phone. No charge, of course. Um, and you can listen to it as they happen. Yeah. And you get notified. Hey, new new podcast. Come listen to Tony. Golden Pipes, you know. <laughs> um, so I urge people to do that. Or if you have any questions you want to talk about the founding fathers, like I said, I'm an investment major, um, particularly financial investments. And then uh, I'm a history minor. So if you want to talk history, I'll talk too. Give me a call. The number here at the office, 888-508-5935. That's 888-508. 5935 and don't forget to sign up for the podcast at dolphinfinancialgroup.com. All right. Well, thanks for that Dan and listeners, stay tuned. We're going to be right back with more of Dan Wendell here on Dolphin Financial Radio. Are you having trouble understanding social security planning? When does it make the most sense for you and your spouse to start receiving social security? What is the impact on your social security benefits if you work during retirement? How much of your social security will be taxed each year? What strategies can you use to fill the income gap between what you receive from social security and the desired amount of income you'd like to receive in your retirement years? Let Dolphin Financial Group provide you with direction to this decision by claiming your complimentary guide to Social Security. Give our office a call at 888-508-5935 or visit us online at dolphinfinancialgroup.com. This is Violet and you're listening to Dolphin Financial Radio. And welcome back to Dolphin Financial Radio with our host and history miner, Dan Wendell of Dolphin <laughs> Financial Group, a uh, financial guru with a minor in history. And today we're talking about the finan the founding fathers and the financial advice uh, that we can glean from them, financial lessons we can learn from our founding fathers. And now we're going to talk about one of my favorites because he was a character uh, and had so much to say and was so influential. I don't even know what he was. Ben Franklin, was he a lawyer, a scientist, uh, all of the above? That's the fascinating part about this, Tony. Ben Franklin was not rich. He he made money. He he didn't inherit land. He wasn't a lawyer charging big bucks. Right. He worked in a print shop. Uh, he was a printer. And he worked his way up to a point where he was able to retire at 42 years old. Wow. Ben Franklin. Wow. Now, granted, 42 was like today is like 80. Right? Oh, yeah. Back, <laughs> back then, then. Back then it was like 85. Yeah, for sure. For sure. No, but it, he did retire young. No. Um, at the peak of his career. And that's fascinating to me. I'm going to talk more about that because there's so much to learn. From Ben Franklin. Well, yeah, I mean, um, he's the only founding father that actually wrote a book about finance. Two hundred and I, I looked it up. Two hundred and sixty years ago, 
Uh, this year, it's the marks the 260th anniversary of his book being published called Way to Wealth. You know what? I've never read that. Well, you've heard all the quotes. Basically, it's just proverbs about wisdom and little sayings about, uh, you know, how to stay wealthy and, and be happy. Uh, and it's called Way to Wealth. But um, uh, you've probably heard most of it. And most of the quotes are what you're probably already going to talk about today. But uh, diligence, yes. you know, stuff like diligence is the mother of good luck and uh uh, drive, drive thy business. Uh, let not that it drive thee. Isn't that fantastic? You know, industry need not wish. Um, he that lives upon hope will die fasting. <laughs> there are no gains without pains. Yeah, I love some of these. Yeah. Did he say a penny saved is a penny earned? Yes. He gets credited for that. Um, yep, one that, of my favorite here, quotes. A penny saved, a penny earned. It's in his book. One of my f- Favorite quotes from Thomas Jefferson, I mean, uh, Ben Franklin, was, beware of little expenses. A small leak will sink a ship. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's true. People say, you know, I'm not the guy that's going to say, hey, stop the Starbucks. Although I will say Starbucks is expensive, by the way. I didn't realize. I don't drink coffee, but I went in there for a tea, and I spent like five bucks for a cup of tea. I was floored. You know, um, I'm going to Publix looking for the buy one, get one from the different teas I like. And anyway, it's just flavored water. Um, B- ben Franklin's uh, beware of little expenses. A small leak will sink a ship. That's um, that's a good one, because, you know, if you let something fester or you don't take care of it or or if you don't, you know, if you have this little expense that you ignore, it eventually you will add up. You want to make sure you're tight. You want to make sure you're doing everything the right way from the beginning. Um, I like that one by Ben Franklin, but I want to talk about his life a little bit here and what happened because you're right. You know, what was he a scientist? He was all these things, but let's talk about what got him there. It was quite an, he's got a very interesting story. And I think the biggest financial lesson from today's show is going to be from Ben Franklin's life and what he did. So you have to look back. He started, um, he was in printing. Let's, we're not going to go into the, the true total details here but eventually he got to the point where he his printing business was spread far and wide usually printing was like a local thing i was um you know we had the tragedy with that local paper in maryland which by the way was around before the revolutionary war um and um they said on uh, the day the revolution the declaration they printed the declaration of independence and it was on page two not page one, because page one was for local news. <laughs> page two is for the <laughs> Nationalist <laughs> Declaration of Independence. I found that fascinating. But um, so printing was local, right? But he was able to spread and spread and get in different parts of the country, Philadelphia and wherever. And eventually he got to the point where he had grown this business where it was huge. And he also created the post office system. And originally he used it just for himself, for his own benefit and for his partners to get information quickly uh, event before eventually turning it over to the public. That's another thing. He, he, he basically invented the post office, right? Now don't Crazy. hold him against, don't hold the current situation of the postage and the mail delivery system today against them. But he did the post, he did a library system, same thing, which I'm a huge fan of. But so he created this printing business and what was fascinating, totally fascinating to me is at the age of 42, he signed a two-page contract with a guy named David Hall. And in the contract, which is only two pages. Now, you do a contract like this where you're doing a business contract today. It's like a dollar in the Revolutionary War is worth 10000 today. Um, a two-page contract back then is probably, you know, you try and do that today, it's like 50 pages, you know, with all the legal lawyers. But again... Ben Franklin wasn't a lawyer. He was a business owner. He partnered with David Hall, and in the contract, it said half of the profits are going to go to Franklin for the next 18 years. The other half are David Hall's. Wow. And Ben Franklin said, I'm done. I'm out. You run the business. 100% of it is yours. He created his own pension. The first uh, annuity. Bingo. The first pension. How awesome is that? So... Think about this. He's 42 years old. 
Now, Ben Franken, I think, lived to 80 or 5 or even 90. I can't remember how old he, he lived a long time. But at 42, he had still half of, he was only halfway through his mid, midlife, midlife. Wow. He retired. And he was getting income from a successful business for the next 18 years. So think about this. Adams, Madison, Washington, Jefferson. They were all in their 20s and 30s, right? Right. Ben Franklin's 42. So th- th- I, 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 I could go all day on this. So he's 42 years old. You have to think about this. He's 42 years old, and he's with these young guys. Now, they're brilliant. Right? Thomas Jefferson was absolutely mind-numbingly brilliant. Yeah. You, you said that at the very beginning of the show. Yeah. But they all were, like, rich already, Washington, Jefferson, or they were lawyers, Adams, Madison. So they, they had income. They had either income from their farms or slaves. They had income from their law practices. Ben Franklin didn't have that. He had income from a pension or his, his, his business sale. So now he's retired, but he's got passive income. Hugely important. Passive income. He was going to get this income no matter what he did. So what did he do? He started becoming a statesman. Literally, he, he, started, he became a scientist. He, he, he's checking exploratory uh, electricity things that he did, right? You know, the yeah. little kite and the key and all that. Key, the right? key on the kite string with lightning, yeah. Right. He, he, um, he, different, um, he started creating militia and got into politics, started getting involved, and look what happened. He founded our country. There's no way Ben Franklin does that if he doesn't strike a deal with David Hall for that 50% profits over 18 years. Yep. He can't do it. He can't live. He doesn't have the time to work on electricity and libraries and founding father business, right? Yeah. We'll call it statesmanship. I mean, he. so he's created this life for himself where he's got this passive income, giving him the free time to then pursue the dreams that he wants to do. And luckily for us as a country, he did this because without his guidance and wisdom, especially with these young guys, he was able to kind of be the the elder statesman at at these meetings to kind of shape our country without caring or getting bogged down and keeping up with the Joneses. Do you, it was, it was, he used to wear a, a raccoon skin cap. When he went to to France, yeah. they they venerated him. They thought he was a, like a country bumpkin, and he played the part. Do you think that he cared about the latest trends? You know, with all the young guys no. that were found? he he's like I made my money. I did it the hard way. Yeah, you know, I don't have you know land. I don't have a law firm that I need to. He just was getting the money, and he was able to focus and do things on his terms, yeah. which is fantastic. He was truly ahead of his time in that regard yeah but hey we're out of time for today's show dan flew by i i wow. like this one great topic why don't you let the listeners know one more time how to get a hold of you and where to go to check out podcasts over the coming week since we're not going to be live on the air for for a while well i hope everyone had a good independence day celebration and i mean that's what we're talking about today the founding fathers and the financial lessons we can learn from them this was a good dolphin financial radio show um hopefully you you were able to glean a few, maybe learn something about your founding fathers, maybe it enticed you to continue to read about them. If you want, I have, um, I have a list of different books on these guys that I read that I find really good. I can share you, uh, share those with you. Or if you want to talk about legit financial issues that you're facing and, and what you want to do for retirement, how you can become the next Ben Franklin and retire at 42, <laughs> give me a call. I'll help you with that. The number is 888 888- Five zero eight five nine three five. But we, as Tony mentioned, I'm going to be traveling a little bit. We're going to do a lot of the shows um, in the next few weeks online uh, as podcasts, which you can easily listen to whenever you want. You don't have to tune in at a certain time. You just go to dolphinfinancialgroup.com, click on the radio button, and you can listen to past shows, this one included, and you can listen to any of the new shows and sign up for notices as to when we upload a new show. That's our podcast at dolphinfinancialgroup.com. So I urge you to do that. We're not going anywhere. We'll still be around. Please subscribe to that. That's dolphinfinancialgroup.com. Or give me a call. I'm going to still have the phone on. It's 
508-508-5935. Tony, thanks for a good show. I enjoy talking about our fanning fathers. Um, hopefully, you picked up a few. I know you you just uh, took a trip out to see the Mount Rushmore yeah. and uh, urge others to do it. Yeah. And happy 4th of July to you. A little belated. Yeah, no problem. And that does it for today's episode of Dolphin Financial Radio with our amazing historian, Dan Wendell. Thank you for listening to Dolphin Financial Radio. Don't try to retire without a solid income plan. For more information, please contact Dan Wendell at Dolphin Financial Group. Call 888-508-5935 or visit the website at dolphinfinancialgroup.com. Dan Wendell or Dolphin Financial Group are not affiliated or endorsed by Social Security or any government agency. Everything discussed on today's show was for informational purpose only. Since everyone's situation is different, some things may not apply to you. The materials presented are believed to be from reliable sources. We cannot be 100% certain that they are accurate. You should really talk to my dad or someone from Dolphin Financial Group before trying to implement these ideas or strategies.